Hello everyone, welcome to Trolling World Logic for February 10th, 2012. It is 6pm in the UK, 1pm Eastern Time. We are a kind of regular internet TV show on issues of atheism, secularism and scepticism. If you do want to call in tonight, the, the Skype contact is Trolling World Logic, all one word. You can email us, contact at trollingwellogic.com. Also, if you do call in, you do grant us permission to use your likeness, as we do later upload the recording to YouTube and iTunes for later viewing. So, I'll introduce my wonderful uh, co-host tonight, making a comeback after a while, Pony. Hello, everybody. And making another comeback after a long sabbatical, Casey. Hey. So we're just going to hand over to uh, very another. You've got two special guests for the price of one tonight. So special guest number one, Martin Wagner, has from the Atheist Experience, has a few words for you. Take it away, Martin. Uh, cheers. Hey guys. Hello, yeah. everyone. Uh, I'm just going to make this really brief uh, uh, piece of news. First off, just reminding everyone that here in Austin, at the end of March, final weekend of March, we have the. Uh, we're hosting the American Atheists uh, 50th Anniversary uh, Convention, and uh, so I uh, definitely want to make sure, hang on a second, let me tr see if this link will come up, if it, this will actually allow me to paste. Um, so if you're in the States, and uh, or are international and are able to do so and can get over here, uh, then by all means do it. Um, I guess that would be fantastic. We'd love to see everyone. Herb, you're coming, right? I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. All right. Well, this isn't allowing me to uh, to actually paste. I'm going to have to type it in, which is a, a bit frustrating. But uh, so there's that. And, um, you know, uh, we're very excited to be doing this. So, you know, some people have asked us, are we doing anything special with the Atheist Experience in conjunction with the convention? And I think Matt has said probably not, just because there will be so many people there. And uh, it would just be impossible and a little bit crazy to try to choose between everyone who wants to participate in the show. So uh, if we do a show that weekend, it's just going to be uh, uh, an average show. You know, folks can come and watch, but I don't think we'll be doing anything like a yeah. you know, convention special. What have right. you. Uh, but we still are, are looking forward to everybody who can come out to Austin that time. So, um, so that'll, be, uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Okay, and you had something else for us. You are going to promote a little. Okay, yeah, well, I have a, a little uh, bit of personal humble brag or something. But okay. um, I'm, uh, as some people might know, I, you know, professionally, I work in film and television. If you, you know, been watching this, if this experience, you might know that about me. And so I am uh, currently kickstarting a documentary film, which uh, has nothing to do with atheism, subject matter wise. But uh, you know, there's other things out there to talk about, and I've. Uh, I found I learned about an interesting uh, historical case uh, about my hometown, Austin, Texas, uh, three years before uh, Jack the Ripper was cutting a swath through London. We had a guy here in Austin who had a who was a lot nastier, had a higher body count, and uh, is but the crimes are very unknown; they're very obscure. And so, for about the last five years, I've been researching that, and I'm doing a, a documentary on it right now. Uh, it's called Bloody Work, and if you go to Kickstarter.com and do a, a title search for Bloody Work, um, check it out, and, and, and please you know, fund that if you feel like uh, pitching a little bit into it, because we're into the last week. And uh, Humble Brag, uh, Friday night, uh, got a surprise tweet about it from uh, no less than Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was uh, that was quite a boost. So so that's my thing. It's kind of a personal thing, uh, but I uh, you know love to see some support from fans of the sh you know atheist experience, people who might know me through my atheist work, or be fascinated to see what else I do. And um, otherwise, beyond that, it's great to be back and talking with you folks. And I'm just sort of gonna go uh, hand it over to you and and yeah. just sit back and enjoy listening to Herb now. Yeah, I was just gonna quickly ask you, Martin, uh, is there any rewards for anyone who donates? Because I'm. Um, I think I don't think many of our viewers will know too much about like what they get out of donating, apart from. The oh right, well you know, donated. Kickstarter is a, yeah, it, it's it's a crowdfunding website. Crowdfunding's kind of become a thing uh, in in the last few years, uh, which is nice because it's very hard for historically for um, 
you know, artists to get the funding, especially if you're an independent, right? That's yeah. always been the stumbling block. And what, uh, you know, the internet has done is it's sort of cut out the middleman. It lets you go right to your audience. And uh, on Kickstarter, what, uh, what Kickstarter specifically set up for artists and creative people to do their creative projects on. In fact, Jeff D., another one of the Atheist Experience co-hosts, has put up a lot of his uh, personal, like, drawing art projects and yeah. game-related projects on Kickstarter and has a lot of had a lot of success with that too. If he's got one up there right now, mm -hmm. um, and you do, and what you do is you can pledge. Uh, for example, if you want to support the thing, uh, you um, you can make a pledge of a certain amount. You don't actually get charged at the time you pledge. I think one of the way that Kickstarter's uh, Kickstarter protects backers is that you have to set a goal and a deadline. And if you don't meet your goal by your deadline, no one who actually has pledged will be charged any money. So no one will be out anything. You have to successfully meet your goal. Uh, but if you pledge a certain amount, uh, then uh, you can choose between one or more various rewards you get, and, and uh, mine range from get a free download, get get a download of the movie, all the way up to you know have your name in the credits, to be a be a producer with your own IMDb page, and and all that sort of thing. So I do have a, a various tiers: DVDs, Blu-rays, special editions, name in the closing credits, all that sort of thing at different levels. And uh, my favorite pledge tier is the one that I offer for $125. Which uh, allows you to become a foul fiend. You can uh, <laughs> join the ranks of the horrible midnight marauders and get your name in a sort of on screen uh, as a thank you. Um, and uh, let me see, do the math real quick. Uh, so only uh, 280 of those. Uh, you know, it sounds a lot, but uh, you know this is expensive to make films. But uh, so that's why I'm encouraging. But, but people can pledge as little as you know, one dollar, two dollars, up to whatever they think that they can do. Mm -hmm. And that's how all the projects on Kickstarter work. Right. And Kickstarter's f uh, founded some uh, fa fascinating things. There have been game consoles and uh, all manner of ideas that people have actually managed to make reality because they mm -hmm. can now go straight to the public with what they're trying to promote and not try to interest a bank or an investor or what have you, you know, the traditional yeah. way. So, so yeah, there's ways to do it. Um, like I said, the name of the thing is Bloody Work. Uh, you can just subtitle search it there, and I'll type some links in later on. But, again, don't want to take up too much of this. <laughs> Talking about me, I just want to, you know, uh, say, but please come to Austin if you're in the States at the end of March uh, to the convention and meet everyone. And, uh, yeah, unless you have any other questions, I'm just going to sort of retreat now and, yeah. and listen to her. Okay. You're not going to put it on History Channel, are you? <laughs> uh, no, because uh, as far as my research has been indicate, uh, been able to indicate, uh, the none of the victims were actually killed by Bigfoot or aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I was tremendously disappointed about that, but then I'm like, you know, what can I do? I got, I got to be all about the facts, you know, and uh, you know, it's just I had no choice. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Martin. And we shall move on to well, um, our headline guest tonight. He is the Distinguished Professor of Mathematics at the College of Charleston. In 1990, he also ran for public office in South Carolina in a bid to remove the barring of non-theistic persons from holding office. He also wrote the wonderful book, Candidate Without a Prayer, an autobiography of a Jewish atheist in the Bible Belt. And he is, I think, the former president of this and founder of the Secular Coalition of America. Will everyone please welcome to the show Herb Silverman. Hi. Hello. Hello. Oh, welcome, welcome to the madhouse, Herb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Yes. So I'm going to get the first question, which you've probably been asked all the time. Are you any relation to David? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, right. Other than through Lucy. Yeah, okay. So well, just to start off, so, um, so were you always an atheist or was it, like I said, I know anyone who's read the book will know this, but we're kind of putting the show out to like folk cameras. So were you always an atheist or were you religious when you grew up? What's your kind of background and sort of deconversion? Well, my background is I grew up as an Orthodox Jew in Philadelphia. That's the most religious kind of Jew. Uh, my, mostly it was my grandmother who was very religious. And we thought of uh, those uh, wishy-washy reformed Jews as almost as bad as Gentiles. Uh, and I'm not sure, I was good in Hebrew school, uh, but we didn't really uh, much talk about God. We'd make uh, comments about and, and following rituals. But then I started reaching the age of reason and I'd ask questions like, who created God? And I never got a good answer for my rabbis. Uh, 
eventually I got interested in mathematics and logic and decided to just hold the parts of Judaism that make sense to me. And some of the uh, you know, ethical parts remained, but suddenly God went away because uh, God and a lot of the rituals just didn't make sense. Okay, and they said, uh, I know in the book you say your family didn't really know that you were an atheist until later on, did they? No, uh, I uh, knew how it would upset them, oh. and we, we, they understood that I wasn't going to synagogue yes. or following any of the rituals, but they assumed I still uh, believed in God because uh, at that time, they didn't know anybody, nor did I, that didn't, except for myself. It wasn't until I was about 15 years old and I read Bertrand Russell's oh, Why I Am Not a Christian, and I said, hey, that's me. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I saw the word atheist, uh, prior to that, I just thought it had something to do with mm. communism. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but, I mean, there weren't people like Dawkins and Hitchens mm. around at that time with best-selling books, so... Uh, I just knew I didn't believe in God, but I didn't really uh, know specifically. I was an atheist. <laughs> I, I know it sounds strange today, yeah. but back in the uh, 50s, it, it wasn't that strange. Yeah. I think it's something like uh, what Julia Sweeney said about, like her mom said, oh, it's okay that you don't believe, but just don't, but an atheist is something else. Right. <laughs> that kind of, so um, like I say, after that, so you went, you were obviously... Um, Oh, sorry, and get my thoughts together. So then, is that when you moved down to the Bible Belt? Also, when you got your PhD in mathematics? Yeah, I went there to teach at the College of Charleston, yeah. and I went. I taught there in 1976, and I've been here ever since. It was though until 1990 that I found out when a colleague of mine pointed out that our state constitution prohibited atheists from becoming governor. I then went to the American Civil Liberties Union here to see how that obviously unconstitutional provision could be changed. And that's when I found out the way to do that is to declare for governor of South Carolina. Okay, and so when you first started to run, what was the reaction just from the community and your family and friends and everyone? Yeah, well, that's when I recognized that uh, atheist is a very provocative word, and not just in South Carolina, because the Associated Press picked up the story, and the following day I got a call from a, a very distressed woman in Philadelphia, my mother. <laughs> and, and, you know, she was really upset that her only child was running for governor and was an atheist. So that's how she found out. And that was a Which of those two things was she more upset by? The well, fact that you're running for governor for Texas? <laughs> when the, well, I think <laughs> what she was most upset about, really, is all her life she wanted me to be respectable. <laughs> and I would always do these sorts of things where, in her eyes, anyhow, I uh, wasn't respectable. So she was partly worried about me not being respectable and also of hurting the Jews uh, <laughs> because she felt like, you know, Everyone else in the world other than Jews are anti-Semites, and she doesn't want to give them ammunition. And being not only a Jew, but a Jewish atheist makes it even worse. So I don't think it was much that she cared about my being a, an atheist as, as much as the reputation of me and of Jews. Well, I say, Eva, was there a change in your professional life even when you, start, when you came out like that? Well, I'm a, a tenured professor at an academic institution that values uh, academic freedom. Yeah. And they told me what's reasonable. You're allowed to run and say what you want as long as you don't indicate uh, that your university is supporting you. And that's fair because they remain neutral. I, they even showed me some letters that from... Uh, past contributors saying they're not going to contribute to the College of Charleston as long as you have an atheist <laughs> there. But, you know, there's nothing they could do. And, you know, they, and somebody would ask an administrator, well, why did you hire an atheist? And he said, well, you know, when we hire a, a math professor, we don't ask about his religious beliefs. And I teach mathematics the same way 
that a, a Christian would teach yeah. mathematics at my institution. So that really shouldn't be a factor. Yeah. Uh, I find it stunning that uh, religion's a factor in determining whether a politician's going to be good at his job or not over there. It, it, I think it's a very foreign concept to us in Europe. Well, actually, I think uh, it is significant uh, because if somebody has a religion that where they don't accept evolution or any science, uh, if it conflicts with the Bible, in my mind, that makes them a bad politician. Yeah. And unfortunately, we have so many of those, although I expect that we also have lots of atheists in Congress, but they feel the need to remain in the closet about it because of fear of losing previous election, uh, future elections. And that's where I'm hoping things will change. And that's what our Secular Coalition for America is trying to do, to have more people come out of the closet yeah. so that people will they'll find out how many atheists are around and people hopefully eventually would uh, judge people based on uh, their character and their political positions rather than on their professed religious beliefs. Uh, can I just button for a second just to let everyone know we're featured on the front page of Blog TV. So if you're on the front page of Blog TV, please come in, join the chat room here. We're live with Secular Coalition, former President Herb Silverman. Casey, you were going to have a question there. Yeah, if you're saying that right now there are closet atheists in Congress, I would beg to differ. <laughs> Did you see uh, he who the, um, who's in Congress? Well, uh, we actually have uh, lobbyists, and we know there are at least 28 members of Congress who, without religious beliefs, either ag calling themselves agnostic or atheist, privately. And we are not outing any people, but in fact, it's not just Democrats. There may even be some Republicans. And Democrats are waiting to come out until a Republican also comes out, where they're afraid that the Democratic Party would be viewed as the atheist party. And it's not unusual when, uh, like, about 16 percent at least of Americans are atheists and the educated even more so. And most of our Congress members, whatever you think of their positions, are generally well-educated. They're lawyers and uh, college graduates. So in the natural expectations, you would think there would be uh, maybe uh, 50 or more atheists in Congress. Yeah, and I'm uh, just going to toss in really quickly here that, you know, the read just answered the question from a minute ago. The reason why our religious belief and affiliation is an issue in terms of your success as a, if you're trying to pursue a political career is because the U.S., uh, the religious culture here, has trained generations and generations and generations of people to equate being religious with being a morally upstanding good citizen and not being religious, being an unbeliever, an atheist, with being the opposite of those things and an and evil bad person even though of course you know just about any survey of uh, just how people behave and how that correlates to what you believe will show precisely the opposites but it's just we have generations of programming mental programming uh to get past yeah that's uh, that's a difficult thing to get past as well because with a family with religions it's the old proverb of uh, getting them early and uh when you get them early and when they're younger, the mind's more impressionable and you give learn fixed Give me the child for patterns. seven years, I'll give you the man. Yeah. So. It's, well, it's easier to get them into a program set of behaviors as well when they're a lot younger. Well, I'm, I'm, well one thing that I might think that, well, the religious issue, did you ever think that maybe it um, has to do with Israel and those sort of topics? Because, well, you know uh, how the people are always um, interested in supporting Israel, mainly because they want to keep it, well, Muslim-free till the end of days. Or something. Well, I think it depends on what kind of religious beliefs. Those are the more fundamentalist kinds of beliefs where people are waiting for the rapture to come and the rapture will come when uh, Jews take over uh, all of the promised land after which Jesus will come and kill all the Jews. 
who don't <laughs> convert immediately. So, I mean, it's a very strange religious belief, but in terms of what you said earlier, that in the U.S., uh, religion and morality are equated in ways that they shouldn't be. I know uh, when I was running for governor and, and I'd be on the radio, uh, there would be typically callers saying, well, as an atheist, I suppose you feel free to go out and rape and murder or do whatever you think you can get away with. And my response to such callers was, with an attitude like that, I hope you continue to believe in a God. <laughs> Or maybe because at the time we didn't have a comment section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we need to and come out of the closet simply to show people that we're good, decent people, uh, even if we happen not to believe in a God. Yeah. And the more people that come out and we find that if friends and neighbors are also atheists, the easier it'll be and the stereotypes of... Uh, the evil atheist who will commit any kind of crimes because they don't have a fear of a deity, I think will eventually go away, just like it happened with the LGBT movement. That's gradually changing, especially with the younger generation. Mm -hmm. So issues like uh, gay marriage uh, won't be a problem, probably even for most religious people like uh, they are now. Yeah, over here at the moment, there currently there's a a big bill being pushed through Parliament uh, to legalize gay marriage. Um, the yeah, we just saw that the uh, the comments gave the thumbs up to that. Yeah, we've got um, the Conservative Party as a whole. They, they're pretty much against it. There are a few who are in favor of it. In particular, I found surprising David Cameron. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got the Liberals who'll vote for it and the Labour. So it's pretty much guaranteed to go through. Yeah. Even in uh, Lords. Um, I think if it goes to the Lords and they turn it away, I think uh, the House of Commons will actually use their power to overturn the Lords. Yeah, but I think it. it's gone through by such a huge majority, though. Yeah, like, yeah, uh, it, it went through by a massive majority. But to, to, to follow up on uh, just uh, what, you, uh, what Herb said just now about you, you, this whole notion that uh, Christians have this idea, that their, their definition of morality is obedience to authority. It's not really having to do with consequences of actions, getting along with your fellow man, what have you. So that's this whole notion of if you don't have the fear of hell uh, reinforcing your behavior, what's to stop you from you know, doing all of these horrible crimes and rape and pillage and murder? And Penn Jillette has a great response to that. He said, well, I already do go out and rape and murder as much as I want. It just happens to be that the amount I want to do those things is 0%. <laughs> <laughs> It's just yeah, we we are not naturally inclined to these acts of evil as as human beings. In fact, I think well, no, studies have shown that there's uh, a natural empathy that people that are that small children are naturally empathic. And yeah, I think it's, it's as you yeah, it's as you grow and you're indoctrinated into various ideologies and belief systems and cultures and in group out group thinking that you begin to uh, develop your darker side. Yeah, and in fact that. Uh, uh, the anniversary of uh, Dawkins' birth is uh, in two more days. I I'm sorry, <laughs> Darwin's. And I would think it's probably even... Uh, same thing. Uh, there, there might have been a time when people did go out and just rape and murder and do wh whatever they felt like, but that generation or that group of people obviously... Uh, was unsuccessful in continuing to reproduce, and now we probably have some genetic predisposition. Sorry for that, we lost our connection. So I think Casey was about to ask Herb a question, and then we'll go on to our caller after that. Actually, I was more like going to say, well, I think that over in the Dallas County area, they've um, gotten a little bit tolerable because back in the day when I was in high school, of course now I'm in college, but well, back when I was in high school, there is actually some uh, atheist teachers that admit that they're atheists on Facebook and well, they don't seem to be getting fired. Yeah. And not surprising, they're science teachers. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, it, even though atheists are often demonized in parts of our culture, the situation is better than it used to be 
we're the uh, fastest growing uh, philosophical group, the nuns, those who have no religion, faster than any uh, Christian, Jewish, or Muslim group. So we're on the right track, and especially among the young people. So I'm very optimistic about the future. Well, some young people, I mean, I remember when I was um, in high school, I know many Christians who were at the high school, and well, they would like throw uh, sometimes, well, back when I was in high school, of course, so uh, I don't really get this problem anymore, but I just remember I would be having a Bible verses thrown in my face, and I remember when during the Reason Rally, they would sit, uh, I remember reading one note saying that they were all possessed by the devil. Well, you know, yeah. there are some liberal Christians who get upset with that brand of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I think if we act reasonable most of the time, even those who don't have the same religious beliefs we do will feel, hey, we seem like nicer people than those wackos on the religious right who are claiming that all of us are going to hell because we happen not to believe in their deity. Yeah, I'm seeing it a lot more as well. It's becoming more and more common coming across Christians who are more liberal, more tolerant, accept evolution as a tool that their God used to create the diversity of life, and they fold the science evolution. into. Yeah, they 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 fold science into their religion. And I think that's a very healthy way of um, looking at their religion and the science. Yeah, yep. a question I like to ask uh, Christians is if science. Uh, conflicts with the Bible, which do you go with? And there's a difference between liberal and, Christ, uh, and conservative Christianity and how they answer that question. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, the Dalai Lama, I think he, he, he said something very interesting. He said that uh, if science came along and proved any part of, uh, off of their religion or their philosophy wrong, then they would have to change their religion and their philosophy. Yeah, because... Even the Buddha um, said that you shouldn't just base your um, uh, all of your knowledge off of a religious texts or even uh, just the teachers. You should um, uh, observe for yourself, and uh, you should, um, and then we'll come with the conclusion. Mm. But I, and I, but I remember at the same time reading something from a, you know, a Christian, uh, conservative creationist fellow who. I don't remember the name. I don't make a habit of storing these people forever in my memory. But uh, this this was a guy who actually went through all the way. I got a PhD in in, in uh, some uh, either biology or you know, a leg, you know legitimate scientific field from proper university where you ought to be expected to know your field. And then he uh, caught Christianity and uh, wrote this lengthy article about the process that he forced himself into, where he deliberately chose to forget everything, all the correct science that he had been taught throughout his entire academic career, just mentally discard it and decide it was worthless uh, in favor of just believing in the Bible. And I am just baffled by the kind of mind that would do that, that kind of mentality. It's like someone um, you know, just uh, walking right off the edge of a cliff and insisting that they aren't falling to their death right up until the point they hit the ground. I don't understand that kind of deliberate, willful ignorance and denial, but people do it, and religion has this power to make people do it. See, the, the thing well, that... When, when you, oh, sorry. When, when you mention falling to your death, uh, that's probably because you think falling to your death is a bad thing. For some people who suddenly... Good point, good point. ...this gift of faith then feel, hey... I'm going to go to heaven and have an eternity of bliss. That may be uh, in the back of their mind why uh, they feel like this is the path to go rather than the scientific path. I, I mean, I, I can't will myself to do that, nor would I want to, because I prefer a reality-based life. But there are some people, I guess, who just are worried about what happens to them after they die. And prefer having a life where they're happy that something good is going to happen when they die. Well, yeah. one thing Excellent. that they will not forget, I'm sure that one thing he won't forget is, oh, he won't forget the debt. 
if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to introduce Martimer into the call. Hello, Marty. 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 Martimer, are you there? Okay, he's not there, so we'll go to the caller instead. Uh, Jay, are you with us? Uh, yes. Okay. Hello, Jay. Can you turn your volume up a little bit? You're very quiet there. Okay, I'll turn it. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Now it's good? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Ask your question, please. Hi, Doctor. Uh, I love when you said uh, someone asked you, someone asked you, where will you go after death? And you tell you told him I will go to medical school as my mom Jewish won't. <laughs> I love the answer. It's really clever and honest answer. And the other point it's uh, it's 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 just catch my 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 ears. Uh, when you said I I spent uh, more than uh, seven years or something like that to get my ride in, 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 uh, in South Colorado, in, in, in South your country Carolina, or yes. in your, yeah, in, yes. your, in, your, in your city. So, uh, and that is more than I spent it in PhD in math. And That's ironically, ironically, uh, bad fact in reality when you atheist uh, suffering just to get uh, their right uh, i i should i should thank you behave of all of us because you fight uh, in your area uh, uh, to, to give the to all of us the right even if uh, even if uh, if you are not in your area uh, that's really appreciated from you well, well, thank you very much, and I see that you did uh, read my book carefully, and I appreciate that. Uh, I, what were they were, uh, she was talking about is that it took me about seven years after I lost the governorship, and the judge said he would only rule on the merits of the case if I won the election. Uh, then I applied to be a notary public. You know, that's someone who stamps documents. And because I couldn't hold any public office. And through seven years of litigation, eventually the South Carolina Supreme Court said that that clause violated uh, the, my First Amendment rights and uh, that voided that part of the uh, South Carolina Constitution. So I did mention it took me longer to get my notary public commission than my PhD in mathematics. But because of all the good things that happened to me in life, it was well worth the wait. Um, quick question. Yeah, um, I did. I know... uh, yeah, Sorry, go Jay, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> no, you're the caller, okay. Jay. So. Uh, uh, unfortunately, doctor, I, I didn't uh, read your, your book because I am in the Middle East. Uh, I cannot get your book. Uh, uh, even, even, even I cannot say what I want in a safe way. Uh, so uh, we are in grave here. We, we don't get uh, what should should get, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But well, I, 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 I I saw your uh, your video in YouTube, and okay. that's really really funny and funny and incredible video uh, in your uh, in your meeting with the secular uh, uh, school or something like this or secular group. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like it. I like it. Your answer when you say when you answer in every single thing, in funny way but intelligent way. I, I love that. And uh, unfortunately, until now, uh, there is no atheist uh, in government in high position uh, around the world, even in USA, and that's uh, uh, so bad. Uh, I wish if uh, all governments around the world accept uh, atheists uh, as a human being, like you said exactly, and I will quote from you uh, because uh, I have honor to quote from you. Uh, uh, you said uh, we, we want equality, we don't want uh, a special treatment. 
Yes, we want we equal ask for rights. equality. Yes, yeah, equal go ahead, rights, not special rights. That's all we ask for. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, so and, do I. And by the way, my book is also on Kindle, or which you can get through Amazon. I don't know if you have the technology there, but it's readily available. And I hope you do someday get to read it, not just the uh, short video on the publisher's website. Thank you very much. I, I wish uh, one day to meet you personal to discuss a lot of things with you. Especially, I, I am. I love uh, math, so I am geek in math too. <laughs> yeah, I am girl, surprise, I am girl, but I love math. <laughs> well, well, good, and I hope someday to meet you too. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Jimmy. No problem. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oops, sorry. <laughs> Mid conversation there. So, guy, uh, Martin Moore, can we introduce you now? No, nope, Martin, we're still not there. So, uh, Pony, do you have a question? Um, I had one that I was going to ask, and I have completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, if you'll come back to me. <laughs> yep. Uh, Martin or Casey, do you have a question right now? No, not, not as such, just enjoying listening. All right. <laughs> So um, there was one thing I wanted to ask uh, Herb, um, when you were running for the, you know, the governorship or whatever it was, yes. did you get, do you feel you got a, like a rougher deal off the media when they interviewed you compared to other candidates? Yeah, well, what would typically happen when I'd be on, the uh, host of the show would make sure to say that I'm not an atheist, I'm a Christian, and they'd often introduce me as uh, a... a uh, a, a so-called atheist, or even an admitted atheist. And I sometimes ask the hosts if uh, they ever introduced a guest as a so-called Baptist or an admitted Catholic, just to show that uh, they weren't exactly being objective when they introduced me. Yeah, and well, I'd say just like, you know, in general, did you find those kind of frosty attitude towards you compared to like when you saw the other candidates on TV? Yeah, well, in a way, because they viewed me not as a serious candidate, yeah. and they were partly right. I wasn't a serious candidate in, in trying to win, but I was serious about promoting atheism as a civil rights where we should be treated equally, and that's the point that I would want to make. Yeah. And the whole idea is, for, with people in South Carolina who don't know that they've even seen other atheists, I felt that whatever people said to me, I just wanted to sound reasonable, show that I had a sense of humor, and perhaps people would have would judge atheists differently. In fact, when, when I hear people say that I'm the only atheist that they know, I'd say, no, I'm not. You know hundreds of atheists. I'm the only one who acknowledges being an atheist. Yeah. And that's why I'm anxious for others to come out of the closet. Uh, so it won't be viewed as so weird yeah. to have an atheist around, especially in a place uh, where I live, uh, known as the Bible Belt. Yeah. There's also another thing in your book, I you always said you were once an apathetic atheist and then went to an activist. While you were like, while you were an apathetic, what was your kind of view on atheist activism back then? I mean, well, when I was an ap apathetic atheist. I didn't even know about atheist activism. Yeah. At that time, this was like in the 1970s, I was living in the Northeast, which is in a pretty liberal area in Massachusetts. And most of the people I knew were probably atheists themselves. But there was no point going around saying I'm an atheist any more than going around and saying I'm a yeah. round earther. And, you know, there is a flat earth society but they have so little influence that yeah. it's not worth talking about whether the, that the earth is round and trying to make a point of. And I thought eventually religion would just fall away and it would be no problem. I was really wrong there. So it was only when I saw fundamentalists taking over school boards and opposing creationism or uh, evolution in school and wanting to teach creationism that I decided that 
I wanted to be more active in what I viewed as a civil rights movement. Yeah, because um, I think Pony might agree with me on here is we do have a lot of apathetic atheists here. Mm, yeah, like that's, that's like, um, like a very common attitude I come across is, oh, why are you bothering? You're just obsessed with this. You're just as bad as they are. And I say, just let it be and everything will work out. That's, um, that's, I think that's because... Now? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Martin. Yeah, well, finally. <laughs> Swedish I, internet. First, first, I had the, first I had the wrong microphone plugged in. <laughs> then I plugged in the right one. Then the settings were wrong. And then Skype was set to a different mic even though I hadn't actually changed it. I think it, oh, I have no idea what the hell uh, is going Swedish on. Swedish engineering comes through in the end, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> no, I thought uh, it was Icelandic. Yes. <laughs> well, let's not start that. Yeah, no, no uh, but, but I, uh, I agree with what you're saying about apathetic atheists. Yeah, is that uh, common in, in, Sweden, in Sweden as well? It's, it's so, um, uh, yeah, saying it, it's almost not like, like, like what you described about saying that you're a round earther it's it's actually to the point of uh, people don't want to call themselves atheists because then it's like they're they have an opinion yeah. it's not even worth thinking about yeah religion. i think that's it so it's if you label yourself an atheist then all of a sudden you know that's taking a a position or something like that, uh, which I disagree with, but that seems to be most people's understanding. They want to say, well, I suppose I'm a Christian, but I don't actually believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think with a lot of uh, people who call themselves a Christian or a Jew or something, will really be talking about their background, how yeah. they were raised, what their family was, and might, just might not want to alienate family members. For me, it was easy as a Jew. You're not required to believe in God. You can be a cultural Jew or a secular Jew or an atheist Jew. Whereas if somebody is raised in a Christian household, it's kind of hard to say that you don't think Jesus was anything special. So I don't know of people who call themselves atheist Christians. And I don't think that's mm. the religion. Because within Judaism, the definition of a Jew is if your mother was a Jew, then you're considered a Jew. And my mother was, so I didn't want to run from calling myself a Jew. Uh, I didn't feel like I should uh, stay in the closet. And that's what I want people to do uh, when, when there was more prejudice against Jews. Some people would hide their identity. Now the prejudice is more toward atheists. And again, yeah. people are hiding their identity. And I've always felt like people should come out with who they are. And that absolutely, I absolutely agree. Oh, well. unless, that, unless that might put, put them in trouble, of course. I mean, it might yeah. not always be safe. Yeah, uh, I but, mean, in uh, such cultures, I could certainly understand. And even in the U.S., if maybe your job would be at stake, yeah. which is why as a tenured math professor, I was able to easily come out, and I'm hoping I and others who were in relatively secure positions will be coming out, just so it'll make it easier for others to come out. As I said, I uh, tried to follow the LGBT movement, where at first it was very risky for someone to come out as a, a, a gay or lesbian, but as time goes by, it's easier and I think in 50 years, people will say, what's the big deal? Yeah. I think that's what a lot of the apathy in Europe is born from uh, when it comes to uh, atheism. It's, uh, it's just a non-issue over here. Mm -hmm. People, we don't think about it. Which is fine with me. I'm hoping for a day when uh, atheists will be treated like anybody else, in which case we can go back to our apathy. But at the moment, uh, I think uh, we need to organize well and promote our atheism so that we can pave the way for a future generation to be apathetic about it. Hmm. Okay, uh, Marty, I know you're a math teacher, so if you have your math questions right now, <laughs> <laughs> fire away. No, not not off the top of my head. I suppose I could 
I could uh, bring out my, my notebook from uh, watching general <laughs> relativity lectures on YouTube, but I, I think the audience would fall asleep. <laughs> And um, one thing I did uh, have, I've, I've regained my train of thought. It's in the Constitution that there should be no religious test for office. So how do individual states get away with saying that uh, uh, someone cannot run for um, a governmental office if they're not religious? I, I, I kind of that kind of confuses me. As well, it should. Uh, be, because of the, our 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, it says essentially that the U.S. Constitution trumps state constitutions if they conflict. Prior to that, you would have state constitutions that would have religious tests for office. And you would also have in our state constitution in South Carolina the uh, miscegenation laws that blacks and whites can't intermarry. Eventually, you, know, you had to follow the U.S. Constitution, so it was un overturned. But the state, in my case, was arguing it's a state's rights issue, that, we, that our government should follow the Constitution of the state of South Carolina and forget what the U.S. Supreme Court says. They were wrong legally, and they knew they were wrong. But the problem is our politicians would rather waste time and money and we spent over $100,000 trying to keep me uh, from being a notary public because they knew it would play well with their constituents. And that's the sad thing that they don't want to so much do the right thing as to do what they think it takes to get reelected. Yeah, they're all, they're all really there... careerists about uh, about these kinds of things. And uh, I was also going to point out that I think we've had uh, well, a couple of Supreme Court cases, are, right? We've had uh, Torcaso v. Watkins was one. Uh, that, uh, so, essentially, so no matter what state constitutions yeah. say, yeah, I mean, um, yeah. Sorry, it, it, exactly. you can run. But I, they keep these things, certain states, especially the really red states, uh, with a very conservative religious uh, constituency, you know, they keep the, the the wording stays in the Constitution uh, as a way so that they can just say to themselves, "Well, you know, we'll do this anyway," and you know, it, it's it's a way of just reinforcing their yeah. the feeling of privilege that they think they need to have to just keep that in there and um, you know, as, uh, as pander to the religious constituency as well as make themselves, I guess, feel a bit righteous. But yeah, it, I, I think it has been now shown through a numerous uh, court, pr there's court precedent that uh, it, it doesn't really apply. And you know, like if I, you know, if any atheist or I or any atheist just wanted to run for office, like right here in Texas, where it says, <laughs> we have a really screwy state constitution. It says something outright to the effect of, there will be no religious test for public office provided you um, believe in a supreme being, uh, <laughs> which is exactly the kind of new speak double think that we're good at here in America. Um, yeah, but but it's it, it's baffling. But we, um, yeah, you know, I, I would probably lose, right? Because my opponent would come just out and be like, "Er, he's an atheist," and all the Texans would go, "Ee!" Uh, but still, I could do it though. There would be nothing right. just saying, "Sorry, Mr. Wagner, you just can't go on the ballot because of that." Yeah, the isn't case there also, isn't the case there also is some. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I just, uh, I just want to ask this real quick. Um, isn't there also some rule about how um, uh, the states can basically have whatever crazy laws they want as long as no one actually challenges it? Because yeah. the Supreme Court has to rule against it, and they're not going to do that unless someone actually brings a case to yes, them. Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. That uh, they can just follow the state constitution, and that's what they do, uh, even if it conflicts with the U.S. Constitution, unless somebody challenges it, in which case they'll lose. Like you had mentioned that the Tercaso case, that was Roy Tercaso versus Maryland. He was also running as a notary public. This was in 1961, and the U.S. Supreme Court said that he had the right. My case was based exactly on that case, and we told the judges and their lawyers and they knew that they were doing something that had no chance of winning. That's uh, and, and that could happen in other states where they want to. They did it anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's because they wanted to get reelected, and they were following the popular will. And as you say, 
you have the right to be an atheist and run. We're trying to take it a step further where it won't be such a detriment and that atheists can run for high political office and win, which is a more difficult thing because here we don't need to just follow the law alone and say, well, we've done our part. We want to be able to change a culture where it's not only legal to hold public office, that, but the people can be elected to public office. Just like we have gays elected, African Americans are elected, uh, and we want to have open atheists elected as well. And that's a goal that we're working toward. Do you feel that um, since the November elections and the, well, I should say, a hammering defeat for the Grand Old Party, do you think things are actually going to start getting better for secularism in the red states? I, I think there's that conflict between economic conservatives and religious conservatives in some of the red states. And the fact that the, the uh, people who favor economic conservatism see these religious conservatives having these wacko candidates who wind up losing an election, that might help gradually change. At least that's what I'm hoping for. That People, the idea is that people can follow whatever religious beliefs they want as long as they're not harming others, but at the same time, follow the Constitution and give others the right to hold their religious or non religious views. And, and of those two distinctions, I think you'll find that um, no one has the capacity to just keep retrenching and retrenching and retrenching in the face of defeat, quite like the uh, social slash religious conservatives. Yeah. Um, because every time they're handed this uh, a massive resounding defeat uh, at the polls or what have you, their immediate thing is, well, this just proves us right. Satan is rallying all the gays and the... You know the 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 feminists and the uh, atheo communist uh, you know Nazi stormtroopers against us, and we must uh, batten down the hatches for you know because Jesus, right? Yeah. So that's uh, you know that there's there's that mentality there. So well, uh, yeah, in terms of like, you know, like somebody predicts the end of the world and a particular date, and it doesn't end, they lose. A lot of followers, but some some still stay with that person, saying, "Well, my math was wrong, and the, the new end of the world is such and such a date." <laughs> that group is getting smaller and smaller, and I'm hoping uh, the religious conservatives that keep uh, saying the same thing, despite evidence to the contrary, and despite losing elections, that will probably still stay but I hope it'll become an ineffectual minority instead of a strong group that had actually taken over the Republican Party in some states, my state included, of South Carolina. Well, we've actually got a, a couple of questions here for you, Herb. Now, the first one's from uh, Cool Vibe, and he says, how many politicians do you think are actually atheists but say they are religious in order to get elected? Well, I, as I said, I, I, there are at least 28 who acknowledged it privately. I would think there might be 50 or even as many as 100 that, if not atheists, would at least call themselves agnostics or humanists or spiritual or even maybe believe or say they believe in a God, but it's it's not a the kind of supernatural deity we think of that's maybe... Uh, defining God is the potential we all have, and then they can say they're believers. But I think uh, what I talk about a lot is functional atheists. That's someone who acts as if there is no God. They might have a belief in some deity uh, and who, who really cre maybe created the world and retired as deity emeritus and doesn't take a part in the world. And for all practical purposes, they behave like other atheists. And I think probably a lot of politicians and many others uh, I would put in the classification of functional atheist. And uh, what do you feel is the next big challenge for atheism in the United States? Well, I think that the challenge that we have is 
uh, just having it acceptable. And also, uh, we are cooperating with some liberal religionists on uh, certain causes, whether it's abortion rights or gay rights or stopping the privileging of religion, because our Constitution not only says no religious test for public office, but we shouldn't favor religion over non-religion or one religion over another religion. And a lot of liberal Christians and Jews uh, are in agreement with us. So we're trying to work through the political process and the cultural process. Initially, we're just trying to stop bad legislation. Hopefully, we'll get more of our strength in numbers to promote good le legislation. One of the problems is that we've had uh, different atheist or humanist organizations all doing their own thing without cooperating. Now, through the Secular Coalition for America, we're becoming more organized and lobbying Congress, uh, making inroads, which is why I think our future looks bright, especially with young people. Like we have the Secular Student Alliance. We even have Camp Quest. So we are working with young people, just like uh, churches have learned that that's an effective way. So in that sense, uh, we're organizing and uh, having young people as a priority uh, to follow the success of churches without bad theology that came with it. I think that's, that, that's probably the biggest challenge is actually changing the culture because cultures get very ingrained in a society and that's the, probably the hardest thing to challenge and change. Yes, I agree. And that's what we're working on. But, you know, people say, well, I really can't do anything. Uh, the, uh, you, people can write letters to the editor or even if uh, they don't want to do very much, just being honest. Uh, like if somebody says, uh, what church do you go to? People will say, well, uh, uh, I'm kind of lazy without saying, well, I don't go to any church. I'm an atheist. Often they'll find out when they mention they're an atheist, there'll be other people that they knew who will say, yeah, me too. So that's, I think, what each individual can do. Just be honest with others about their religious beliefs. They don't have to uh, do, go into somebody's face and bring it up, go door to door and say things like, have you found there is no God? and then start preaching, uh, mm. just be... Yeah, um, I think there was another question um, from somebody here. Yeah, uh, Blue Ball said he's got a degree in advanced physics and he goes to church and wondering where that, uh, where that puts him. Well, um, I, it, oh, sorry, it depends on what going to church means. Like, I've gone to church too. Sometimes uh, the Unitarian Church will have a good speaker that I want to hear and uh, I'll listen, but that doesn't make me a believer. I'm more interested not in does somebody happen to go to church. It could be for cultural reasons. It might be for business reasons. I'm more interested in what kind of God beliefs a person has. And it could be that you have a, a physics PhD uh, who does believe in God. That happens, but it's a minority. For instance, uh, in the, the, uh, among the top scientists in the Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, 92% of them are atheists. That means there are 8% who believe uh, in a God, but, and that happens, but they're a minority. And I, I would like to see the entire culture have maybe uh, at most 8% who believe in a, a personal uh, God. We're a, a long ways off, but we're moving in the right direction. But among those uh, few percent uh, of the high, uh, high level scientists who actually do believe in a God, uh, like you mentioned, what kind of God is it that they believe in? I mean, it's obviously not the God of a, a literal reading of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard, I think, to say be uh, a, a scientist and a creationist at the same time thinking that uh, the universe is 6,000 years old. Uh, yeah, and I mean, it could be, yeah, often if, if I hear somebody say, I believe in God, I'd say, what kind of God? 
And it might wind up based on their definition. I could say I'm a believer too. It's just not a creator God. Yeah. If, uh, if they believe that uh, in uh, the wonder and awe of nature, I'd say, yeah, I have wonder and awe too. So if you want to call that a belief, but okay, I'm a believer, but yeah. it really just means nothing. Yeah, because I, I've had uh, I've had students uh, who uh, who were religious, but uh, still, I mean, really good at physics. I mean, okay, uh, I'm talking about high school level here, but you know, I could easily see these these kids uh, majoring in physics, uh, and um, I mean, uh, I've had some very rewarding exchanges with them, but you know. What do they believe, and and how how does that work out when we get into talking about uh, the very very basics of modern cosmology, for example? And uh, I, I've never seen that their beliefs conflict with science. It's always you know, yeah, but there there well there needs to be something more outside of that. You know, like they don't deny reality; they add to it instead. And yeah, I, I, I don't see that that kind of religious beliefs are a problem. Uh, I mean, we can we can talk about them being irrational, but I I, I don't. Well, think maybe not, they're not a problem in terms of how they will affect, for example, how how that person would, uh, you know, might judge gays or people of other races or or, or, or social issues yeah. like that. But I think it's still, in, in general principles, uh, a bad idea. They're a problem in that. You know, all things being equal, what's better? Uh, to go through life having a set of beliefs that uh, conform uh, to observable reality or that don't, especially. Yeah. Which, I th which is just a general uh, guideline for uh, a better, more successful life. I would argue uh, that having beliefs that do comport to reality are, are better on the whole. There may, it may, again, yeah, it's not harmful... They're not a pro those kinds of uh, you know sort of vague kind of waffly new agey deistic -y, uh, you know ideas about what may be out there. Yeah, they're not harmful in the way that uh, they'll turn you into a raging Fred Phelps bigot. But I think that it's just um, you know it, it it'll lead to uh, you know epistemologically it's just maybe not yeah. your best way to go about your business. Yeah, that, that uh, I agree. With. Yeah, and and I do too. But I'm still not that concerned about the kind of person who acts just like most atheists would act in their daily life uh, based on uh, most kinds of reality, but might have this inner feeling that there's some um, deity watching over them and they just feel better because of that, because they need that kind of a crutch. And at the same time are for gay rights, abortion rights, and most things where they're not caught up in what the Bible, written two or three thousand years ago, says about these issues, but have reasonable lights, life outside of their... Uh, yeah, yeah, those, those definitely aren't the problem believers. I think as P. Z. Myers said, and uh, you know, he's, uh, you know if, if, if religion were just a, sort of this kind of personal um, hobby or, you know, something, if it were, more, if it were like knitting, right? Or doing crosswords, we we wouldn't care. You know, it'd be fine. It'd be great. Exactly. But uh, yeah, there's mm -hmm. there you know the, there's the group of religious people who are are a problem, and the ones who aren't. And so uh, we don't yeah, need to worry about the latter. Yeah, we're targeting the uh, problem ones, especially in a Bible Belt where that might be a majority. And we're trying to make them ineffectual. And we could live with that as long as they don't turn to violence. Uh, as a minority to try to change things. Yeah. I think that's that's the real worry, particularly in the States, because there's a lot of, um, <clears throat> particularly, uh, I think, amongst the, the problem religious, as, as we've labeled them, there's a, a sense of paranoia that because they're being challenged so much, that their religious freedoms are, we're trying to strip them away from them. And you could see the paranoia building, especially with recent, events in the states and it could um unfortunately and i hope i'm wrong but a lot of them are talking about defending their religious reliance with violence well a lot of them when they say they're losing their religious rights 
What it is, is they're losing the religious privileges that they had in the past, where everybody, they assume, was Christian, and that was the kind of life to live. Now, when they're seeing other groups who want their rights as much as Christians want theirs, and that's happening, they suddenly feel paranoid about losing their rights. Then the question that you raised is a good one about how do they react to it? If they react, well, we, we need to try to do something legally, or better yet, they decide, well, these people are just wrong. I'm going to maintain my religious faith no, no matter what they say, and I'll live according to my religious faith. That's okay, as long as their religious faith doesn't mean uh, tramping out the infidel uh, with violence. And those yeah. are the ones that we need to be careful about. So I think it's a much smaller group that might potentially turn to violence. And that can happen in any culture and not just for religious reasons. So we need to monitor that and otherwise give people the religious freedom that, that we all should have, however silly it might be for some religions. Mm. I'm just going to button just to say we are still featured on the front page of Blog TV. So if you are on the front page, please hop into the chat, join in. We're live with special guest Herb Silverman, also special guest Martin Wagner from the Atheist Experience. So please hop in. Um, who was up next with the questions? No one. <laughs> ah, here we go. This is actually a very interesting one from uh, oh, Tea Parties yeah, for isn't. All. Uh, who do you feel could actually be a good role model for a more secular Republican Party? Well, I, I will say that uh, our new executive director for the Secular Coalition for America, Edwina Rogers, comes from a Republican background as, and has worked with some Republican politicians. She's an economic conservative but uh, she agrees with all the positions the Secular Coalition for America has uh, uh, held. And basically, it should be uh, atheists should have uh, equal rights with everyone else and no religious test for public office. And I really would be happy if there are closeted economic conservatives who are very upset about how the religious right has taken over the party and want to go back to the kind of Republican Party we had originally with people like Abraham Lincoln, whose comment about religion I really like. And he said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. Then, of course, uh, uh, there's Robert Ingersoll, who was a Republican and uh, uh, was a, uh, a, a one of the best orators around uh, in the Republican Party. Uh, and he was an openly a, a non-theist. So those are the kind of Republicans I'd like to see today, the kind that we some of them were in the uh, 19th century. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's it, interesting how things have changed in the last 100, 150 years. I, you know, I mean, the, uh, the the Democratic Party back then, you know, in the Tammany Hall and all that, that the Democrats were the party of, uh, you know, the uh, the corrupt one percenters, and the Republicans were the ones all about, oh, abolition and what have you. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a complete about face on, on that score. Well, there have been two major shifts. One is in 1948 when Harry Truman uh, you know, had a, passed some civil rights legislation and my own uh, senator from South Carolina, Strom Thurmond, walked out and started a different party. And that brought some people away from the solid South of Democrats, which was the more racist party at the time. And then in 1964 or 65, Lyndon Johnson passed the major civil rights legislation, and he said at the time that this is going to ruin the Democratic Party in the South for the next generation. As it turned out, he was uh, overly optimistic because it's been more than a generation, but 
it's it had been that the Democrats were the more racist party. Now it's the Republicans that are the more racist party and slash religious party. And that's primarily uh, in the Bible Belt. And I think for quite a while, uh, racist attitudes and uh, religious attitudes, unfortunately, it had a high correlation uh, because if you look at the Bible, there's a chosen people and you don't want to go too far outside your narrow circle. Um, yeah, going back to the, um, the, the potential for uh, the more extreme and conservative religious people to perhaps resort to violence, this brings up a very interesting question about gun control in the United States. Now, there's a lot of people who will point to the Second Amendment of the Constitution, obviously, and say that their right to bear arms personally is protected by the Constitution. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the whole gun control debate and and I just want to point out the hypocrisy of using the Constitution to enforce one of their rights, and yet when it comes to a religious test for political office, they just seem to ignore it. <laughs> Welcome to the States. <laughs> well, I, what you say about the Constitution, you can also say about the Bible. Uh, you know, those who want to commit violence, uh, who are religious, will find biblical justification for it. Those who want to work for peace, We'll find biblical justification because you can about just about anything. Even the uh, Second Amendment, I think it's rather controversial. It, they don't usually say that these gun rights are for a well-regulated militia. And to me, uh, well-regulated means something like our uh, National Guard, not that everyone should be allowed to have any kind of weapon. Now, if and, I and we didn't have this centralized military, and so right. there was this fear at the time that you know, well, the, you know, the red coat, you know, red coats could still send uh, some ships over and 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 you know, to give us a hard time, and so uh, your local communities might need to be ready for that. We yeah, still and, could, you know. And, yeah, yes, and, well. <laughs> and, but e even if, for people who have lots of guns in their house, if the army uh, came after them. They, that would be kind of useless. They might kill a lot of people in the process, but it's not going to work. Part of the problem is you can't put the genie back in the bottle in the United States because there are over a hundred million people with guns in the U.S. and you can't come and take each gun away. Mm. But at the very least, you should have background checks on people getting guns uh, and some other kinds of tests, just like on getting driver's licenses. Uh, and uh, if somebody is mentally ill or committed violence before, you should not issue them guns. But some of the people in the gun lobby industry with the National Rifle Association are fighting any kinds of uh, reasonable legislation, and that's what's become problematic in the United States. Yeah, they, they couch absolutely everything, e even the most uh, you know liberal, uh, relaxed uh, attempt at you know common sense legislation as this. Uh, you know, oh no, here's the uh, the hostile takeover and and uh, you know the they tyrannical call government. It slippery slope. Yeah, it's 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 completely it's completely preserved. I think though that you know I, for more and more people though, I mean, you know, the more you know, school classrooms get shot to pieces and what have you. you know, this it, it, gradually scales are sort of falling off people's eyes, and uh, you know, with his latest round of. Uh, media appearances of Wayne LaPierre, who runs the uh, National Rifle Association here, which is, you know, the big lobbying uh, pro-gun group, is just looking more and more and more like just some tinfoil hat-ass clown uh, who's living in this bizarre sort of, you know, bunker mentality, uh, you know, dystopian uh, uh, mindset that is really freaky. And uh, so it's, um, again, you're right, the toothpaste is out of the tube here and with something like 880 guns in circulation for every 1,000 Americans. It's not as if we can just go ahead and pass the kinds of gun control legislations that you guys enjoy in England, that they have in Japan, other countries, 
we're going to have to find new solutions. But it's, it's just like any solution. There is this very loud uh, vocal contingent. They're just like, no, 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 they're taking your guns. The we just had on, on our mailing list, or mail, I say mailing list, but you know, we have our TV show address um, you know, the, for Atheist Experience that people can write us in, and, and it just goes to the hosts. And, and we have just been dealing with this. Uh, Gen Peoples, my goodness, um, just really took to the mat. This crazy paranoid girl and her, uh, you know, it started out kind of reasonably the conversation, but it just got more and more and more into, oh, a tyrannical government taking over, blah, 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 blah. And, and Jen is calmly giving her military expertise, being ex army. And the girl is just being more and more histrionic as the conversation goes on. And you're like, well, this is the kind of, it's exactly the kind of mentality that you get with people who are anti gay marriage, anti evolution. Uh, what have you? It's this retrenching and retrenching of no, you're, th it, it, you're threatening me. You're threatening me with your opposing view, and I, I must, uh, um, you know, retrench more and more and more. And that is the, the it, that's why we can't have the rational discussion here in the states about, well, gee, you know, shouldn't we do something about lunatics with freaking assault rifles going around shooting up six-year-olds? Oh, this isn't the time to talk about that. We need to talk. Or, about it. What, when or, is the time? Or now they're, they're talking about it, but their solutions are, let's have armed guards in every classroom. Let's uh, have... More guns. More guns is always the solution to the gun it problem. Didn't, it didn't work in Columbine. Yeah, and, and we have such problems funding education correctly, and people don't want to raise taxes. So take some of the tax money instead of on having better quality education, just having armed guards and training teachers how to shoot people who might come into a classroom. That's not did, going it, to improve safety or education. It didn't work at Fort Hood. We have Fort Hood, the biggest, largest military uh, base in, in, in the country, and, and there was a mass shooting there. You know, they, they kind of, they have lots of guns at military bases. That's what they do there. A lot of a, very powerful guns. <laughs> uh, just had... Um, a very prominent uh, figure, and you know the, the, this fellow who is a, a, a military sniper with a you know high kill count and is a rec recognized expert in his field, who had written books. Um, you know this is uh, probably you know the the the, the pro gun side's very definition of um, you know a gun owner who knows the, what he's all about. He was just shot to death at a uh, at a shooting range um, uh, by some uh, PTSD afflicted uh, veteran. That he was uh, dealing with, and uh, you know, trying to help the guy. And, you know, here's an expert, right, uh, at a shooting range where they have guns, and and he's just uh, murdered wantonly by this by this very sick uh, man. Um, I don't, and I, and but they just keep maintaining that fantasy, right? No, more guns will be the solution. We have to arm teachers. We have to arm uh, everyone. Arm the kids. Arm the six-year-olds. <laughs> Well, um, up till 1970, as I recall, even the NRA believed that the Second Amendment wasn't talking about the personal right to bear arms. It was talking about organized uh, militias. It wasn't until the gun manufacturers actually got control of the NRA that that, uh, that changed, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, that was the case, that the NRA is much worse today than it used to be. And part of it is financial. I agree. And I think just like with religion, there's a tendency maybe not so much to look at the evidence, but you have this preconceived notion of what you want your culture to be, regardless of what harm might come in it. Yeah, I think a lot as well of the... Um uh, the people who are against gun control, they point at other countries and say, well, look at the violent crime rates in these countries. And they seem to fail to forget that, one, in England, we do still have a right to bear arms. You just have to prove that you are capable and mentally stable of owning a gun. And uh, they seem to, to forget that. Or the uh, left-wing, more anti-gun control propaganda over there will neglect to mention that there are still firearms in the UK. And there's also the situation you have in the UK where you've got public health, right? So mm -hmm. somebody who's mentally ill has easy access to um, being able to get treatment for his affliction. We don't have that here. So one nice thing that would be uh, would 
possibly help things is let's make it as easy for a mentally Ill, uh, Ill individual to get mental health care as it is for him to get his hands on a freaking AK-47. But, but part of the problem when you talk about other countries, the kinds of people who are biblically based or gun based, uh, are also xenophobic. They don't want immigrants. They don't want to do what other countries do because they say, again, without evidence, that America is the greatest country in the world and we don't have to listen to what they do. They have to listen to what we do. Mm. Um, one interesting question someone's just brought up, and I think uh, using the Second Amendment as a framework for the question, is the US Constitution actually due an update, or uh, I would say, is it due for being thrown out and rewritten? Well, there, there are really inherent <coughs> dangers <coughs> in having an update of the Constitution. If I could update the Constitution the way I want it to be, that'd be great but a constitutional convention that some people are asking about, that means uh, politicians who are involved with that can pass whatever new laws they want if you start over. And in theory, we could even go back to slavery, which I don't think we would do, but we might get rid of a lot of our good laws and some of our basic human rights, uh, which could be problematic. So part of me wants to see a constitutional convention where we can do lots of significant changes. Another part of me is scared. Maybe I just don't have as much confidence in the American public as I wish I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Constitution is a, you know, a living document. So, um, you know, the, the capacity to, that's why we have amendments to it and have a process for, uh, you know, uh, passing those or choosing not to pass those. But yeah, it's, um, it's still it's certainly you know throwing it out and rewriting it is is off the table. But um, I don't know if um, it's going to be. It's I think it's going to be again. I am not a legal scholar, not a lawyer, etc., etc., etc. But it seems to me that the proper approach would be leave the Constitution be, but let's let you know a, a case law and the Supreme Court and you know the political process determine exactly how we interpret what it ha the Constitution has to say about proper gun ownership, re legitimate, responsible, uh, legal gun ownership versus not, and then how we use our legislation to support that and enforce that. And, uh, and that's the problem is you know, these clear legal definitions of you know, what, what does and does not constitute what, uh, you know, what, the, what the document says is that's always where the fight happens and that's what we need to, that's where that, that's where that discussion needs to take place. I don't think it needs to be, oh, well, let's just see about revising the Constitution because I agree with her. If then you open a wacky can of worms that mm -hmm. just you don't know where it's going to. Well, yeah, I, you... I think basically we, we have a good Constitution written by brilliant founders but they knew their fallibility, which is why they allowed for amendments to the Constitution in future generations uh, who would have more evidence. And that, to me, is one of the many advantages of the U.S. Constitution over the Bible. The writers of the Bible did not allow any amendments, which uh, now looks kind of foolish when religious people are going by a book written by misogynistic sheep herders a couple thousand years ago and claiming that that should not be changed one iota. Uh, one thing one thing that I, I, I just thought about, what if uh, rather than throwing out the Constitution, using the, the original Constitution as a framework for building a, f a further document that could be used to um, not necessarily supersede the Constitution, but to clarify it? Well, well, the Constitution continually is clarified uh, through Supreme Court rulings about what such and such means, and those precedents are often followed uh, in future law cases. Sometimes people will disagree with that clarification, and that's why there are often uh, fights about who should go on the Supreme Court, because there are liberal justices and conservative justices. So our Constitution, no matter how you frame it, 
uh, will be open for interpretation. That's why there's so many five to four decisions on a Supreme Court, uh, all of whom supposedly are experts at reading the Constitution. Um, let me have a look. Yeah, um, Herb, I was just going to ask just to go into your work with the Secular Coalition of America. So how did that all get started up? Like, what was the big motivation to get the Secular Coalition going? Well, the big motivation, like after I got engaged in the secular movement through running for office, first locally, then I started hearing about some national organizations and they all seemed pretty good. So I wound up joining just about all of them, like American Atheists, American Humanist Association, Atheist Alliance, Council for Secular Humanism. And I was even wondering, why are all, why do we have so many of these groups? And even more disturbing was that they were just doing their own thing, sometimes he, saying, hey, we're the best organization, those other organizations aren't very good. But they, were, they might have been the best, but at the same time, they weren't doing anything to change the culture. And I felt it was really important. This was about the time the Christian coalition was getting a lot of influence. And I felt we need a secular coalition. And that's why it was named where I uh, talked to leaders in all of these organizations. Initially, we had four member organizations. Now it's up to 11 different national non-theistic organizations. And because we're cooperating now on the 95% we have in common and not talking among our group about the 5% that sets us apart, we're able to accomplish things. And say American atheists might want to focus on one issue within their organization, an American humanist association on different issues, that's fine. And they should, they, we're all independent organizations, but when we come together as a co coalition, we should focus on what the mission of the Secular Coalition is, and that's to increase the visibility of and respect for non-theistic viewpoints and to protect and strengthen the secular character of our government. All the organizations want to do that. That's why we hired uh, lobbyists in D.C. to help us with that and public relations people, and why we've now started 50 state secular coalitions in, in the United States to not only work on a national level, but to try to work within each state. And we're making gradual process, but moving in the right direction. Okay, and I uh, also read in your book, you were like the first kind of secular group to have a, I don't know, an appointment with the president or like a, or talks with the president, like with yeah. Obama last year. Yes, we had a meeting with White House officials uh, to tell what problems we were having uh, for atheists. Like there'd be proselytizing in the military and we explained some of the problems there. Like one of our 11 member organizations is the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers. And these are people who have served in Afghanistan or Iraq and they should have the same rights as others in the military instead of being hassled and proselytized for the, their views. And we also talked about uh, faith-based issues where uh, faith-based organizations don't have to have the same kind of uh, provisions for daycare centers, say, as secular organizations and children have died because of that. And there are many different issues that our government uh, should be aware about and uh, come out on our side. Uh, interestingly, uh, when that happened, lots of uh, Christian groups said this is an outrage that the president is meeting with atheists or his, uh, his staff is like, we should have no right to the country. Um, wasn't there a law recently passed granting atheism the same protection as most religion or all religions in America? Well, when you say recently, that's part of our original constitution about not having any religious tests for public office. Uh, so that's in theory what should have happened in the beginning, but then certain states 
uh, were claiming uh, rights or privileges for some uh, religious beliefs, not others, or atheists should not be able to hold public office or housing. Uh, and when these laws are challenged, if it ever gets to the Supreme Court, those people are going to lose. But the fact that it's still in the books makes it more difficult. And there's less support among the general public to change it simply because of uh, the negative view they have of atheism, which is why a lot of my focus is on changing the culture. Because once the culture changes, then atheists won't be hassled. And some of the laws that people try to pass denigrating atheists uh, will not work. Okay, questions, any guys? No. <laughs> Blue Ball's got a fun one. What are we going to be arguing about 50 years from now? <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I, I'm not a, uh, a psychic or uh, someone who can see in the future. I hope it won't be the same issues that we're arguing about right now. I hope they'll have been solved for the positive. And aside from that, uh, as I know about human nature, we'll be arguing about uh, some issues, but not the bad issues as bad as today. Just like we're not l any longer arguing about whether slavery should be part of our cultures. Nobody, even fundamentalist Christians today, think that uh, one human should be allowed to own another human. Whereas that was the accepted wisdom a uh, hundred or 150 years ago in the Bible Belt. So I'm hoping that uh, allowing atheists to have equal rights will not be something about anymore. They'll look back, I would like to think, and say, why did those people in 2013 make that such a big issue? Yeah. Uh, I was also going to, so. I mean, how has the secular coalition progressed since it was first started? I mean, has it grown more than you would have thought? or Much more just... than I would have yeah. thought. Initially, I just wanted to get some secular groups together and stop trying to fight each other so that we can all get along. And mm. be, initially, people would worry about what word to call, <laughs> pe call others. Like, should we be called atheists or humanists? or a secular humanist. And lots of these organizations would promote their word is better than the other word. My view is whatever you want to call yourself, call yourself that. And let's have atheists respecting people who want to be called humanists, humanists respecting secular humanists and all. Mm -hmm. And let's cooperate on the issues important to us. That uh, conversation, I think, is over. Sometimes we'll talk about why Tactically, it's better to use the word atheist in certain situations and maybe secular humanists in other situations. Uh, that's fine. And not only that, the fact that we've grown from four organizations to 11 is much more than I had ever anticipated. So I'm very pleased with the progress we've made. And I had been president of the Secular Coalition for 10 years. That's long enough for anyone, I think, to be had, maybe even too long. We now have a very dynamic new president, Dave Neosi, who used to be president of the American Humanist Association. We have many younger people. When I first got into the movement, uh, most people were like in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now we have people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s as well. So yeah. it's very broad-based with many more people great new ideas, and that's where my optimism and the long term comes from. Yeah. Uh, did you have a question there, Pony? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm happy. This has uh, been absolutely fascinating today. Yeah. Um, sorry, it was uh, another question regarding um, the secular... You were, you were also involved in the billboard campaigns, weren't you, I think? Well, not the secular coalition yeah, right. per se, but many of our member organizations, like the American yeah. Atheist has oh, yeah. billboards, the Humanist Association has billboards. There's a coalition of reason that 
had, it's a, an independent organization that uh, signed on to the mission statement of the Secular Coalition, and they've been funding billboards around the country, where if you have several local groups cooperating, they'll put up a billboard uh, about our views. So we're making ourselves known in the culture. That's another really positive change. When I first uh, was running for office, there were no local uh, secular humanist or atheist groups around. Now, in every state, you'll be able to find a local or a state group mm -hmm. around. So we're becoming not only organized on the national level, but there are many local organizations. So almost wherever you move, you can uh, Google a uh, secular group that you can be part of. Right. Um I was also going to ask you, in the book, if you could kind of explain, yeah, Bill Donahue reacted quite badly to your meeting with Obama. Can you tell everyone how that went? Oh, well, what he said is he's going to investigate the Secular Coalition for America and what happened at that closed meeting. And a couple of days later, I... I wrote an article in the Washington Post saying his uh, investigation doesn't seem to be going very well because he didn't contact me, the president, or any of the other board members to ask about it. So then I just wrote an article, uh, and the article it was on the Washington Post, and it's, I also I mentioned in the book about what we actually did when we met with uh, uh, the staff of the president uh, about the issues that we discussed. There was nothing uh, that was secret about it, and we want to promote the same thing to the general public we promoted with the, the uh, presidential members that we talked to. Yeah. Um, was it just one other question. Which uh, religious group in particular reacted the strongest to the secular coalition? Like, which one, like, which denomination out of all of them really went off the heads when you... Like when you uh, just basically when you came into existence. Oh well, uh, a lot of them just ignored us initially, hoping we would go away. But whenever a, a group reacts to us negatively, we feel we we're doing our job right because <laughs> they're getting a little worried that we're getting some traction. And at different times, different groups uh, come in. Like if we mention that women should be not have uh, religious reasons used to, for abortion to be prevented, often yeah. some Catholic group will come into it. But I do want to mention that we cooperate very well with some religious groups when we go in to lobby, like Americans United for Separation of Church and State, headed by the Reverend Barry Lynn, is very cooperative with us on issues of concern to us. The same with the Interfaith Alliance on a lot of issues because they want separation of church and state as much as we do. So we'll uh, collaborate with some uh, liberal religious groups on specific issues, which is turning, we hope, the conservative religious groups into a minority with less power. So often, these same conservative groups that rail against a secular coalition also rail against, like, Americans United for Separation of Church and State and liberal religious groups. So it's kind of liberal religions and the secular coalition versus the rest of the uh, religious right, and we're getting closer to being a majority there. We, don't, we certainly don't agree with all the uh, yeah. liberal religious groups on issues important to us or in promoting uh, you know, secularism, and but for the most part, we agree on issues that come before Congress. Okay. I was just going to say, have you, like since the last election, have you had any, like the, the right and the conservatives, uh, have they tried to kind of reach out to you or, you know, has there been kind of a, a warming in the yeah, that's actually become very positive because with the Secular Coalition for America, we do have weekly calls that are open for anybody who wants to get online. And we've even had 
some politicians, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, talking to us where we'll tell them our positions, they'll tell us what their positions are. So at least they're recognizing our existence and they're willing to open dialogue with us. Because of, I think, the humiliating defeat they had, they see where the nuns, that, that is those with no religion, vote overwhelmingly against mm. Republicans, just as now Republicans who were so anti-immigrant are starting to reach out more to Hispanics and changing their positions on immigration. I don't think it's necessarily because they suddenly uh, changed their, their views, but just they see it's politically bad to maintain the same position they had before. Maybe even they're saying now what they always believed but thought to get elected, they had to say the opposite. And it could be the same with politicians who I think for the most part, their religion is to get reelected and they'll do almost whatever it takes to, and whatever they have to say for that. And once they see that uh, the non-theistic community is organized and getting bigger with more traction, I think a lot of politicians will look more favorably on us. Yeah. About that whole uh, idea of organizing in the non-religious, aren't there like a lot of different tiny organizations? I mean, you, you, you have like the secular coalition thing, but there are all these smaller groups. How is that working out? Is it, uh, is it working at all? Yes, it is. Uh, what we have, uh, and if you look at our website, secular.org, you'll see our 11 major organizations, the national organizations, part of the Secular Coalition. But you'll also see endorsements of our mission statement by smaller organizations. And that's grown enormously where they might not be national in scope, so they're not yet ready to join this Secular Coalition. But we cooperate with these smaller groups they get action alerts from us about legislation. Uh, we help them, uh, they help us, we link to each other, and we cooperate. And that's what a lot of it is about, being better organized, cooperating with one another, and getting our action alerts so that members of Congress can hear uh, what they're saying, just so they know there are lots of us out there and we're looking at their votes. So big or small, we want them all to work with us on issues of common interest to us. And we want to help small organizations grow to become larger organizations. Yeah, great. Uh, I think we've got 10 minutes left. So I wanted to ask now that, well, you're no longer the president of the Secular Coalition, if I heard right. Yes, I'm... Uh, yeah. uh, now known as founder and president emeritus of the Secular okay. Coalition. Uh, I was I've just asked, what's your uh, plans for the future? Or will you still be active and visible in the movement? Yes, very much so. In fact, they put me on the advisory board of the Secular Coalition. So I'll continue to come to some of their meetings and be giving advice as needed. And it's, it's a very distinguished advisory board. Mm -hmm meaning that I'm the least distinguished of the members on the advisory board when we have people like Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and uh, Susan Jacoby, Wendy Kaminer, Michael Newdell, Steven Pinker, lots of very prestigious people who have done a lot in our community as members of the advisory board. So I still want to become active, stay active, this is now my passion since I'm a retired math professor. I'm also the American Humanist Association Board of Directors, which is one of the member organizations of the Secular Coalition, too. So I'm active there as well. All right. Um, I'm on the board of the Secular Student Alliance. So there's a lot of activity that many of us can do. And uh, I'm getting older, and I know when it's time to cut back some and yet let younger people with new ideas come into the fold. And I want to mostly support 
those who come in with new ideas, and I can give historical background to these people, but I don't want to say, you know, well, I've been in this movement for 30 years, so you have to listen to me about what's <laughs> best. I want to spend my time listening to newer people in the movement and younger people yeah. for them to tell me what's best. And I'll agree or disagree based on uh, uh, what my views are, but I'll recognize that my time is gradually uh, receding. And I, I feel good about that, that there are others uh, so competent to take my place and the place of many others who have been in the movement a long time and hopefully will also be stepping aside for younger, enthusiastic people to come in. Yeah. And do you have any plans for any more books? Well, you know, right now I'm doing a, a number of book talks on the candidate without a prayer. And I, my publisher had mentioned because there have been a, po a lot of positive comments on one chapter I have on uh, biblical faith where I mentioned like just uh, 10 examples about Adam and Eve and that, that sort of stuff, Noah, and give my atheist tech uh, point of view about a lesson that can be learned from what is said, even it's a fable, much of fables would have more associated with it. So I, I mentioned that I think the Bible can be a book if we take some of this stuff from it and treat it as fables. And my public suggested writing a book with a Christian and, and plus a different take on each section of the Bible. Uh, and right now, for a Christian who uh, is and a decent writer, so maybe we'll have a con combined i interested in promoting uh, the candidate out of prayer, my book. Okay. So it, was, it, it broke up quite a little bit there at the end, but I think we got it. Did everyone hear her book, eh? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we do have seven minutes left, so I'll let everyone, this is the final questions round before we wrap up. So if you do have a final question, just ask ahead. No, can't think of anything. Uh, Martin, do you have any final questions? No, I've just really enjoyed listening to the show and listening to Herb. Thanks for inviting me to uh, be part of the show today. Yep. Uh, Pony, do you have any final words there? No, no, I've just been enjoying listening and asking questions. Uh, I think I've asked my lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Herb, we usually let the guests, if, there's, if you've we have a few minutes now. You can get on your soapbox and give your message and promote anything you want. Well, it'd probably be in large part repeating because most of the time <laughs> I think I've been on my soapbox. And that was when I wrote uh, this journey from uh, uh, Orthodox Jew in Philadelphia to apathetic atheist to activist atheist. And again, the reason for that is because I suddenly saw, or, or gradually saw, the importance of uh, atheism as a civil rights issue. In the past, it had always I'd been supportive of civil rights, you know, for African Americans, for women, for gays and lesbians, uh, and I never thought of myself as any kind of in any kind of need for civil rights until. Uh, I saw that not only could I not run for governor in South Carolina, and that's how I knew that would eventually change, but how much people seem to hate atheists for no apparent reason, from my perspective, other than that the Bible tells me to, and the kind of misconception of atheism. So that became my mission and my passion uh, to show people that they shouldn't hate atheists. I, I wasn't really trying to convert people from Christianity to atheism, because I don't really think that we convert people. We tell people uh, why we came to our views, what we uh, accept, and then let people convert themselves if they're open to it. But I do want to convert people into saying, look, 
atheists aren't evil like you may have been told in your uh, religious tradition. Get to know us, and you might like some, dislike some, but treat people as individuals. So that's, I guess, my soapbox. And a lot of my book is explaining that in various kinds of contexts. Yeah, uh, I suppose we'll let Martin, you can have a wee soapbox moment as well, promote anything you want before we wrap up as well. <laughs> okay. Well, mainly just to sort of stay on topic. Yeah, I'd like to just invite everyone to uh, in the States again or, or with uh, access to a plane. Uh, please get here to Austin at the uh, end of March for the American Atheist Convention. Uh, and here, I think in about uh, two, so in about in two and a half hours' time, uh, you know, uh, the Atheist Experience is going live. So uh, be ready for that. Um, uh, Matt is is out of town this weekend. He's at the North uh, Texas um, Secular uh, Conference going on right now. But uh, he, um, so it'll be Russell and uh, a co-host. That's live, uh, but uh, thanks for having me on. Um, oh, it's been again. a pleasure. And it's uh, always enjoy listening, and I'm glad to see that uh, Trolling with Logic is really growing. Oh, thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, and so thank you for having me on. Really yeah. So everyone in the chat room, thumbs up for Herb and thumbs up for Martin as well for turning out. It's been an absolute pleasure, guys. We are back next weekend, and it's the return of the live ponage, and it's John Morris Pendleton will be tackling. Yay. <laughs> and then uh, two weeks after that, just to let you know, our next guest is Sanal Edamaraku. He's the head of the Indian Rationalist Association and he's kind of living in Europe as he can't return to his home country as he's um, facing blasphemy charges in India because he debunked the miracle of a weeping statue of the Virgin Mary. They um, hate it when that happens. Yes. They just <laughs> But it was even funnier because he pointed out he, he was saving lives because the tears were actually the, low, the, the sewage pipe was leaking onto the statue and people were drinking it. Uh. <laughs> so, yeah, all that to look forward to. And there's a heap of other guests. Please go to our, our website to check out, get all the information on upcoming guests. Links are all below to subscribe. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks very much.